everybody. Uh, welcome to the 1570 Project this week. I am really excited to have my friend uh, John Green, who actually is the person who trained me on my basics in firearms, in how to clean them, how to shoot them, uh, how to be safe with them, which is so important, as we know. Um, so I brought him on today because it seems like every day there is a new news story about what's going on with gun control and how it's going to affect regular people like me who are, you know, thinking about jumping in. I have to admit, John, I'm like almost embarrassed to admit that even though I did the course with you, I haven't actually taken the plunge and gotten into having a gun in the house myself just because it just seems like so much and you know i'm a a regular person It's it's a big step i've got four kids i've got chickens i've got dogs you know we had construction on our house we moved this that you know and it's just like it I'm the type of person that I do a ton of research and I want to do it right and I want to have all the right things and do it above board, everything the legal way. I don't want to, I hate getting in trouble. I'm always scared I'm going to get in trouble. We would sum that up as, oh, great, a a responsible firearms owner, (laughs) right? (laughs) And that's that's what we should all endeavor to do, be as compliant as possible. But certainly when we talk about responsibility, that's knowing and and utilizing the gun safety rules and and training. Mm -hmm. It's fleeting, right? It's it's like anything else. It requires positive positive repetition. Right. And it, as you know, we had a great time out on the range that day. Oh yeah. Shooting yeah. is fun, and what we're seeing now is so many people are afraid. I'm, I I want a gun for my protection. Yeah, we get all that. I I miss I miss how it was four or five years ago where we were inundated with classes because people went to the range with friends and family and said, "Oh, this is a lot of fun. I'd like to get a gun recreationally." And now we're seeing people coming into classes. They want to obtain a, a firearm for their protection in the home, outside the home. Mm-hmm. And we all get that. But if it's done correctly, I hope people realize that shooting is just such a great recreational activity. It really is. And there are mm-hmm. so many different types of, of shooting events. We get all that. We get all that. Yeah. And now we know that the government is uh, making it difficult. I often talk to people. I had a uh, did an appraisal the other day. I'm a state and federally licensed firearms dealer. Mm-hmm. And the uh, person that was helping to handle the estate says, oh, I have a lot of friends that are gun people. And, and they, you know, they're, they're gun nuts, right? And, and they think that people are trying to take away their guns from them. I said, I, I don't want to disagree with you, but I've been doing this for 22 years they're correct. There are people, there are bureaucrats and and legislators that are in fact trying through regulatory schemes to take guns away from good people. I think we need to realize we should all be in agreement that there are people that should have no guns, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about violent people, people that don't have the mental faculties to, to be a responsible gun owner. But why are we trying to take away some guns from some people? Right. It doesn't solve any issues. Mm hmm. There are people that probably shouldn't have guns and, uh, and 100%. We should, uh, know that. And that's why we have, contrary to popular belief of some people, we have background checks for, for yes. guns um, on almost every single sale already. Um, so on I, every single sale as it pertains to mm-hmm. a deal, a transfer. And it's been that way since the Gun Control Act of 1968. Every gun that has entered the retail stream has undergone a background check. And currently, that background check looks something like like this. Here's a federal form 4473. Mm-hmm. It's required by all federally licensed dealers. And uh, I don't think people argue that they're not a good tool when used appropriately. And the states are, are conveying that information to the National Instant Check folks. Right. And so there's been some talk lately um, about about, you know, Biden wants to have background checks, which obviously the Democrats always say this in in Congress, like, oh, we need to have background checks. We need to close the so-called gun show loophole, which the uh, the non-existent gun show loophole. loophole. But I mean, I'm just blown away that we're like still on these same talking points that we were on, you know, when I did that class with you, it's probably like, what five years ago now I'm guessing or something five or six years ago yeah so that you haven't aged a bit <laughs> oh, thank you <laughs> you too looking great um but you know it's like the the laws change but they're still on the same talking points of we need background checks which we have and we need to ban assault weapons which are not the problem i mean biden just came out last night and did this whole big speech about you know how how the rise in crime in inner cities is due to guns and so we need to ban assault weapons and i'm sitting here thinking like 
first of all, the rise in crime isn't limited to gun crime. It's yeah. it's all kinds of crime. And second of all, like how many of these crimes are even being committed with assault weapons? This isn't about assault weapons. This yeah, is they, often like handguns and stuff. Right? What do they say that the the hammers are used to commit more homicides than all rifles combined? Huh, like wow. Hammers. It, it's just it's ridiculous. We know that they are rewarding bad behavior is what they're doing. We have mm -hmm. some really wonderful folks in law enforcement. They're doing their jobs. They're putting their life on the lines. They are arresting these 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 bad people and the revolving door of our court systems, just releasing bad and violent criminals back out onto the street. And that's why, you know, so many people that weren't interested in the recreational aspect of firearms ownership are now interested in the in the uh, personal protection aspect of firearms ownership. Right. Who can blame them? I think, what did Nolte say the other day? Uh, you know, the, the, grab yourself an assault rifle, right? Mm -hmm. All good people should be, should be arming with themselves with an assault rifle. I, I hate the term because there's really no such thing in citizens' yeah. hands as an assault rifle. It's it's a semi-automatic rifle. Let's call it what it is, right? It just looks different mm -hmm. when they talk about the venerable AR-15, Eugene Stoner's design from 19, what, mid-50s. Geez, if it was a card, be wow. considered an antique. The gun the media loves to hate, right? Right. <laughs> Right. And there are so many misconceptions about it. And then even the definitions of what is an assault weapon in the law change overnight. We saw that um, when Chipman, this ATF nominee, was there, he couldn't define what an assault weapon was. He yeah. referred back to the bill. Oh, there's tons of pages of definition of what it is. And we saw the same thing in Massachusetts when our definition of an assault weapon changed because the attorney general felt that she wanted to make it something different one day. <laughs> After what, 20, I have to do the math, 24, 26 years of understood state and federal law. Alice, what a lot of people, a lot of Massachusetts residents don't know about is under our laws, I think it's chapter 140, section 123, mm -hmm. all gun shops, all firearms retailers in the Commonwealth shall, not may, but shall be inspected by their local issuing authority wow. annually. So that means every gun shop in Massachusetts from September 14th, 1994 until July 20th of 2016 were being inspected annually mm -hmm. by their local chief of police or his or her designee. And not one ever said, oh, that AR-15 style rifle with the 10 round magazine and, and no bayonet lug or mm -hmm. flash suppressor and a fixed stock is illegal. And then, of course, we have this this one elected official that says, oh, no, everybody's been wrong for, you know, 26 plus years. They are, in fact, assault weapons. Right. No. Paid sales tax. Those are all reported to the wow. firearms record bureau. It, it's malarkey is what it is. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I think when I was with you that day and we did that training, didn't we shoot one of those not assault weapons, but kind of like an assault weapon under mass law <laughs> guns <laughs> that Absolutely. day. Every time I, I take people to the range, I always uh, try to take an AR-15 style rifle, semi-automatic rifle, just to dispel the myth. Right. right. It's just it, it fires the same cyclic rate as mm -hmm. the, the semi-automatic pistol you fired moments before. Right. Because a gun is a gun. And so well said. this is like one of these things that scares me when I think about getting into actually owning guns and having them in the house is it's like, I don't have time to keep track of what the laws are, you know, so I get worried that, like, I'm just going to be going about my business owning a bump stock or whatever it is. And then like, all of a sudden, it will be illegal. And if I'm not like keeping up with the news, I'll be a felon overnight, because I didn't, you know, hand in my thing. It's a very valid concern when we when we look at Massachusetts general law. You know, do the laws change overnight? Well, theoretically, they change with the swipe of a signature, right? Mm -hmm. we, we have herrings and bills and what have you. I get that. You brought up a great point with the bump stocks, right? We had a number of, of elected officials that were highly favored by Goal saying, oh, no, this is a good thing. And Goal's, Goal wants this. No, of course, Goal doesn't want this. Right. You're taking you're taking. How many citizens, I don't think we'll ever know how many thousands of people in Massachusetts own that piece of plastic. And literally what the legislature did was they said, OK, first, we're going to make that piece of plastic illegal. And then we're going to pass a law, of course, by statute. And then we're going to, to pass a punishment clause in that law that says, you know, possession of this piece of plastic that was legal moments ago that is now illegal is punishable by what, 10 years in jail? 
it, it's absolutely wow. ridiculous. Yeah, so and that's scary yes, as a regular we, person. Like, so you're at goal and you follow this stuff and, and keep track of the laws. That's the Gun Owners Action League. If you're not in Massachusetts, it's... Um, you know, a group that does training, education, follows the legal status of all these different things. And, um, you know, but for regular people who are just, you know, trying to get into firearms ownership or, you know, have a gun for protection or for hunting, like, doesn't that type of regulatory environment, like, really hurt regular firearms owners? It potentially does. I mean, let's face it. In Massachusetts, we have mandatory safety training. What that means is if you did not hold a license, a, a card or an FID card or an mm -hmm. LVC on or before June 1st of 1998, by statute, you have to take one of 29 different approved basic firearm safety courses. We can argue whether that's a good thing or, or, or not a good thing. But the, the point is that all of these classes, because they've been certified by the Colonel of the State Police, must convey to the, the candidate the, the applicable laws on possession, storage and transportation. Much of that is subjective, right? At, right. at what point do we look at a sex and, and say, oh, well, this is applicable and this is not. Nowhere in, in any of our requirements, whether set forth in statute or regulation, are we required to forewarn the general public that, okay, they passed a law and if you have this piece of plastic, you're in illegal possession of it and it's punishable by 10 years in jail, right? right. So. Right. And, and the and class just, is a one time thing. Right. It just happens when you first start out. And if you've been a if you've been a gun over and over for 10 years and they change the law, like, I mean, you might not even know. Take take a look at this. This is one of my favorite things to, to grab the audience's attention when mm -hmm. we're doing law shows. Blank sheet of paper. I hold this up. I said, this is state gun law in what now 21 constitutional carry states. Right. So we can say, hey, New Hampshire state gun law. Of course, New Hampshire has some state gun laws, but mm -hmm. but. They, they default to federal law. Federal law for the typical, and I don't know if that's the proper word, for the typical gun owner is fairly easy to understand, right? Right. This is the Massachusetts Law Enforcement Guide to Gun Law and Regulation. Right? Unreal. The last, the last eight pages, and I'll show you this, the last eight pages are federal gun law because federal gun law is fairly easy to understand when we're talking about pistols and revolvers and rifles and shotguns. But in Massachusetts, oh, there's just so much to know. And the regulatory aspects can literally change overnight. I mean, what, what the Attorney General Maura Healy did with regard to semi-automatic rifles, that was very unexpected and occurred over a 24-hour period. So your point that it can change overnight is 100% accurate. Yeah, and that's scary. And that's, I feel like, so we live in Massachusetts, so we're just unlucky enough to have to deal with this in some ways. But seeing like the type of people that want to run federal gun law this way, you know, put as not like a nominee to run the ATF or, you know, in, in, in Biden's White House, you know, coming up with firearms policy right now, that's a scary thing because, you know, like if I get sick of Massachusetts and their crazy laws, I can always move to another state. I think Texas just passed constitutional carry, if yes, I'm not wrong. Effect, and, I think in October. Yeah, and um, and you know Vermont has always had it. We have a house in Vermont. I'll just move there yes. if it gets too crazy here. But, but you know, you're if limited they do to this... fifteen round magazines or less. Okay, so they Never have knew. they have tricky rules there too. So sure. you know, but. If they do it federally, there's really no more, like no country on earth they, has they what we have. There's nowhere to go to, you know, a after the United States kind of. We're very concerned and, and, and ultimately if, if good people in the rest of America don't wake up literally very, very soon, they're going to experience what Massachusetts has experienced since 1998 and before with our ridiculous and, and, and lack of common sense gun law and regulation. Right? We've been living yeah. with it. We have, we're one of the only states that have secured storage laws. Do you know if you fail to secure a handgun or a large capacity rifle or shotgun where somebody who's not yet 18 and doesn't have an FID card could gain access to it, the punishment is up to 15 years in state prison. Wow. We're not talking a, 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 a terrible event happening. We're talking right. about law enforcement coming into our home for whatever reason, typically a medical emergency. Wow. And they spy a 
a handgun that's not properly secured and you have a you know you have a, a, a 17 year old son or daughter who's very responsible around firearms because you brought them up to respect firearms uh, and, and the ultimate punishment for that parent or guardian could be up to 15 years in state prison people in Kentucky they can't fathom that right yeah people don't get how bad it it can become and sure. you know I we look at sort of, you know, we have this 50-50 Senate right now and say like, oh, phew, nothing can get passed. They're not going to pass any of these crazy bills that are out there. But like, I just worry that, you know, people have, who haven't experienced Amora Healy as their attorney general don't really get how how much can change just on the basis of who's in your executive branch, even without 100%. Congress doing anything. I mean, like, the power what, of the pen. Yeah, what what are some things you worry about when you see like people somebody like Chipman be nominated to the ATF? One of my trusted resources is the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Mm -hmm. The NSSF is to the industry what what the National Rifle Association is to gun owners. Right. So members of the NSSF include all of our manufacturers, our clay target manufacturers, ammunition, our, our locker manufacturers. So they they put a lot of time, effort and energy into their resource. And I was just reading something that Biden yesterday uh, has proposed various task force. Right? Nobody wants a bad person to have a gun. But now we have the power of the pen followed by, you know, federal regulators. And it appears that these poor AT, these uh, poor uh, federal firearms licensees, should they have a, a misprint on their form 4473, I really think Biden is going to direct these ATF compliance inspectors to start pulling licenses. We're not talking about dealers that are arming criminals. We're right. talking about dealers that are following to their best of ability, both federal and state regulation and statute, and mm -hmm. maybe have a typo on one of their reporting forms. And now I think Biden is going to use that or Biden's, you know, compliance inspectors to literally physically revoke the federal dealers licenses that so many great gun shops have. Yeah, that's scary. that is scary, because that's, you know, all about access, you know, I've heard lots of my friends on the left always compare like, oh, I think it should be just as easy to get an abortion as a gun. And, you know, every time like there's fewer abortion clinics, they worry about access. And like that's the type of thing I think about with gun ownership, too, is like if you have to drive, you know, 15 hours away to get to your nearest gun store because they're shutting people down. That is worrisome. I hadn't really thought of it from that end. I had, you know... Obviously, there's concerns with Chipman because he's talked about going after people who uh, don't pass the background check, um, you know, saying that we can we can catch people who want guns before they commit a crime, that we can we can find the bad actors Almost before like they do anything report. wrong. Exactly. Like, mm. That kind of attitude is is scary. But going after the, the dealers as well, that's like very worrisome as well, because then even if you're not the person who dared to not pass the background check, then, you know, then that could limit your access as well. True words. If they think of it this way, federal government is, oh, you, we're not, we're going to, we're not going to, to uh, take you on with regard to your second amendment civil rights, you know, second amendment, second amendment, but it's worthless if you can't go and physically obtain a firearm for your personal protection or all the other fringe benefits that our second amendment civil rights offer, mm -hmm. right? Supply and demand, supply and demand. Right. That's what I'm most, most afraid of, most afraid of. Also this defund the, the, the various police departments. Listen, you and I both know that that is all about trying to centralize law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Federal government wants all the power. They don't want the states to have choices. They don't want states to have power. I think the Biden administration is going after what the, the Missouri or the Mississippi governor, because they've just passed laws that say directing their state's law enforcement not to uphold any federal gun regulation yeah. and yeah. have further stated that any officer that does will be arrested. Right. Hmm. Something to that effect. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. Right. Of course, that that puts the federal uh, federal authorities on their heels, on their heels. And that's what it's all about. The concentration of power. Right now. And of course, liberals were all thrilled about this during Trump, that they ha had sanctuary cities where they weren't going to enforce federal immigration law. But if it comes to federal gun law, it's upsetting to them that states can do their own thing or or whatever. <laughs> the the hypocrisy is. is just maddening. Right. Right. So, you know, that's um, that's like one 
flashpoint between the states and the government is this sort of Missouri thing where they're saying that they're not going to enforce the federal gun laws. But then on the other side, in some ways, um, the federal government actually upholding the Second Amendment, particularly in the judicial branch, what we're seeing, um, that's actually a positive. And, you know, I had my issues with Trump. It's no secret to my listeners that I haven't always loved Trump. But, like, thank goodness for those Supreme Court justices, honestly, because I feel much better about it knowing that that there are people who aren't these like activists legislate from the bench justices on the Supreme Court who are going to try and dismantle the Second Amendment. And we just saw like this ruling in California saying that they um, that their uh, assault weapons ban is potentially unconstitutional. Yes. So what and does now the, the yeah. end bank from the Ninth, uh, Ninth Circuit has has upheld the uh, California assault weapons ban. You know, mm-hmm. and that's just another peg moving it forward to uh, Supreme Court. Listen, we, we had the Worman versus Healy decision or the Worman versus Healy case uh, surrounding our assault weapons ban here right. in Massachusetts. I know that the goal in the NRA paid hundreds of thousands of dollars getting that all the way up to the Supreme Court. And unfortunately, in June of 2019, the Supreme Court denied that case mm-hmm. along with, I don't know, eight or 10 other Second Amendment related cases for for that 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 year so now we're hopeful that there are other cases and of course this is one of the premier cases that is Mm -hmm. absolutely going to have to drive the case further to the supreme court whether or not they hear it or not is is another different thing we also have what uh, the uh, new york state rifle and pistol association verse uh, the, the name escapes me, which deals with the carrying or the possessing of firearms outside of one's oh, home. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So there's some there's some interesting cases moving forward. And of course, the Supremes did agree to hear the New York State Rifle and Pistol case. Okay. So we're, we're optimistic on that. Yeah. So the California one, if that ends up going to the Supreme Court, will that potentially affect the Massachusetts ban as well? The assault weapons ban? 100 percent. 100 percent. So uh, and, and that's where it ends. It, it ends at the at the United States Supreme Court. So if this case from California, and the name will probably change before it gets there, mm-hmm. is actually heard by the, the, the Supremes and they, they, you know, their judgment uh, applauds the Second Amendment civil rights stating that, yes, the semi-automatic gun, guns in common use are right. protected by the Second Amendment. Then what that means to Maura Healy, and of course, I'm not an attorney, just try to be well read, mm-hmm. is that Massachusetts will once again have the choice. Our responsible citizens will have the choice as to whether or not they own these semi-automatic rifles and pistols and shotguns that are capable of holding more than some unique number of cartridges. Right. Or, you know, whether a gun has like certain features and features. accessories on exactly. it, like you put on or, one or, accessory or and you take it stock. off and you're <laughs> inside and outside the law. It's like a t- scary thing. Uh, <laughs> we had, I'll never forget the author of, of uh, the, this book here, The Law Enforcement Guide to Firearms Law. Mm-hmm had a statement. He says, in Massachusetts, we'll issue somebody a firearms identification card, and that allows them to possess a 12-gauge shotgun loaded with 10 rounds of of double-aught buckshot, right? So Mm -hmm. if we do our math, that's what, nine times five? So that's 45 nine millimeter bullets coming out of the gun at once, but they won't trust you with a 38 caliber five shot revolver carried in your pocket on a public way. Just, we know you and I are intelligent folks. There's Mm -hmm. no rhyme or reason. We have bureaucrats and elected officials that are in some cases, very intelligent folks. They're, They're familiar with the subject matter who don't want you and I to have the choice as to whether or not we own guns for lots of different reasons. And then you have your legislators and bureaucrats that just base everything on emotion rather than the data. And unfortunately, right. that never works out for for the good, responsible citizen. It just mm-hmm. never does. Yeah. And I think when the laws are this sort of fuzzy and open to interpretation, like this is when you end up with injustices happening with, you know, unfair enforcement of the laws, right? Like just in general, if the law Law is clear and obvious and people understand it and it like doesn't change on the whim of one person, then it's much easier for everybody to follow the laws. But, you know, when you have this sort of shifting sands of an environment, it, you know, it puts people at risk of getting in trouble and like unfailingly because this is what happens. It's always like the people who are poorer, who have less time. I mean, I would, I've, 
heard statistics saying that lots of the newer gun owners right now are people of color and women and people who haven't owned guns before who have less experience in this. And I worry that that's the people that this is going to hurt, like the people that our Democrat friends always say they want to help, like that, that this is this is who's going to end up getting caught in the middle of these like sort of gray area laws. That's who's going to you know, not be able to pay for good lawyers and who's not going to have time to to keep up with all the changes because like regular people don't always who aren't, you know, doing this very seriously or don't have tons of years of experience in this. Um, you, you, you talk about the generality and the fact that the way our laws are written. Let me give you a really good example. Mm-hmm. So we have a, a Massachusetts Supreme Court case that, that is based on storage, the, the law of chapter 140, section 131. And what the what the Massachusetts Supreme Court stated was that you have to secure your firearms, your guns, to, to, to use the general sense, in a way that will deter all but the most persistent. Hmm. Alice, what the hell does that mean yeah. to deter all but the most persistent? Could they come up with a more subjective term? Right. right? So persistence is a very subjective term. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what we face here in Massachusetts. And of course, that's the one that leads to up to 15 years in jail. Should, you know, somebody that's not yet 18 gain access to that that gun. Mm -hmm. They don't even have to do something terrible. Right. Right. Um, This is what we what we face. We also see we we have 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say 300 of them are are very good. We have good police chiefs. We have good licensing officers. We all agree not everybody should have a gun, but the good people, the responsible people should at least have the choice as to whether or not they, they own guns. At least that's what our founding fathers intended. But to be from Boston and to be from Quincy or Newton or Lowell, Massachusetts, where you can be, you know, just a good human being, a compassionate human being, and they make it nearly impossible for you to arm yourself when outside your home. It's absolutely terrible. Also, we have to remember in Massachusetts, and this is a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow. The fact of the matter is it's been every Republican governor since Governor King. Governor King was a good friend to to lawful gun owners in the Commonwealth, a very good friend. Mm -hmm. But every Republican governor since that has held that corner office has signed in anti-Second Amendment civil rights laws. Hmm. Look at what Salucci did right after, you know, redefining what guns were and creating all these different classes of licensing and revoking. He revoked all of our LTCs and FID cards in 1998. We had to start anew. Right. And then Baker and Polito with regard to the bump stocks and, and, mm-hmm. and you know, not censuring the, the attorney general, uh, allowing one person to change written law overnight. It's just I, I don't hold a lot of uh, respect uh, for people of, of any political party that that attacks the most lawful and, and compassionate segment of all our society. The lawful gun owner, the responsible gun owner here in Massachusetts. Right. Right. And, you know, Biden, his rhetoric yesterday, too, just blew me away. Him talking about about gun owners, you know, joking about deer wearing Kevlar vests and stuff and, you know, saying that the government's going to come after you with nukes if you dare to try and stand up against it. It's unbelievable. Like, the, I mean, you know, I hear people say this, like activisty people say things like that. It's kind of astonishing to hear it coming from the president of the United States. president of the United States. Especially especially when, you know, he's made his case for being president on, like, I'm decent, I'm moderate, I'm bipartisan, I'm not extreme. This is, yeah, unity. I'm the president for all Americans. Well, like, wow, that short didn't sound like it yesterday. It kind of blew me away. It, it, very scary. And, and he has the cabinet that supports him, or I should say <laughs> the, the cabinet that directs him. That's mm-hmm. that's appears what we, we see here. The, the you know, he's the puppet and there are there are puppet masters, but he's certainly no friend to responsible gun owners anywhere in the United States. Right. So I mean, because this is what worries me is, you know, we have things happen. And like, I love Rand Paul. I think he's great on one a of lot my of favorites. these issues. One and, of my favorites. you know, he had a bill out there with Brianna Taylor's name on it saying, you know, we should end these no knock raids of police coming in. And, and he was assaulted that and, night. 
Yeah, and he was assaulting people I saying, say her name, say her name. It's like, guys, go look it up. He has a bill with her name on it. <laughs> right? Oh, it's maddening. The ignorance. Right? The and, ignorance. And and they're supported by mm-hmm. by Biden and, and his administration. Personally, I think that's all by design. I, I yeah. really do. Yeah, it's but I think about like the people that want this type of gun control and how can they justify that when you have things happen like what happened with Breonna Taylor, where her boyfriend who was in the house was illegal gun owner and was in my opinion like justified in believing there was some kind of break-in because you know people busted down the door and you know he shot like it's I don't blame the police for shooting when somebody was shooting at them but I also think they never should have been put in that position in the first place to be banging down the door in the middle of the night 100% are are there cases for no knock wants now granted I'm not law enforcement Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of law enforcement I hold them in very high regard some of my very close friends have made made the choice to become police officers but you know in in the majority of no knock cases that I'm aware of why could they not? We have all, you know, law enforcement literally has has resources, vast resources. Why not wait that person out for? Mm-hmm. I don't care if it's twenty days or sixty days. Right. Right. If we value human life, why would we put? Mm-hmm. I mean, poor Brianna Taylor and her family. Why? Why would we sacrifice a, a good human being because of of, of uh, time? Right. When right. we we have the resources to to you know. Put police officers around their house until they come out, shut off the power, play, I don't know, music that they mm-hmm. don't like. Sooner or later, they're going to come out and, and and we're certainly going to mitigate right. the loss of human life. And there's not going to be any question that it's law enforcement. Did they hear him say it? Did they not hear them say it? You know, exactly. And like I think about this and I think about the laws that gun control advocates want to make you like the most popular rifle in the country illegal and like huh, there will be a Breonna Taylor a day if they get what they want like how do they envision this working like yeah if you had a magic wand and you could just make AR-15s magically disappear overnight like maybe in from everybody from military right. and law enforcement and citizen I mean then then like okay but here in the real world like how are you planning on doing this since there's already millions and millions of them out there like without without killing a bunch of people like that's what i don't get and putting law enforcement in terrible situations like i said like i think the brianna taylor situation is like i don't think the law enforcement wanted to be getting shot at either (laughs) necessarily their preference probably would have not been to be there we don't often get a a, a fair shake from media that ar-15 in your hands or my hands is an assault weapon Mm -hmm. in the hands of a police officer it's a patrol rifle Hmm. Right. So terminology matters. Terminology matters. That's why I I can't stand the term assault rifle. It's a semi-automatic rifle. And of course, the elderly, the elderly don't care if military cops have them. They want theirs because that's the ultimate protection for for somebody that can't handle the recoil of a of a a a smaller gun, a a handgun, Hmm. if you will. I mean, look at the McCloskey's where where I found it uh, very uh, successful that they defended their lives and their property with the country's most popular semi-automatic rifle, not an individual's harmed, but they had the wherewithal and the presence to, to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And of course, in their plea bargain, they had to give up their, their, their rifle and their pistol, but they were, they were charged and found guilty of a very less, less, less uh, misdemeanor. And they were able to go and replace uh, their older AR-15 with Mm -hmm. a new AR-15. Truly is NSSF, Alice had stated uh, approximately 20 million AR-15s have been manufactured manufactured and sold in these United States right. since uh, the beginning of the, the former federal assault weapons ban. Right. So, I mean, what what do they think the plan is? How are they going to get all these rifles back into, you know, law enforcement hands to be destroyed or whatever? Like, I don't I I don't understand, like what they envision happening here. I, I think I think I can I can address that because mm-hmm. we're seeing this a little bit on on Massachusetts. So what the federal government ultimately wants to do in in our belief is they don't want to arrest anybody per se. They'll make the object, whatever it is, a bump stock, an AR-15 illegal. And if they catch you on something else, 
then they have this additional charge. So they know, you know, law enforcement's not ready to go around knocking on doors or kicking down doors, Mm -hmm. you know, in in the general sense to confiscate these guns, but they will, oh, we have a harassment report against you. So we're revoking your license. If you don't immediately turn in all your guns, then you're going to be charged with something else. And the, and you know, the average hardworking American citizen, like, do I, do I lose my house or do I lose my second amendment civil rights? Mm. I'm going to give up my civil rights first. I need the roof for myself and my family. And that's a choice that no good American should, no human being, no good human being anywhere on the, the planet should have to make. And this is the plan of, of, of our government. Right. And I mean, how can they think that that will actually make any impact? Like how many homicides is that going to prevent if they do it that way? Well, guns are easy to build. That's right. the simple fact. They're just a tool. They're mm-hmm. just a tool. And now we have, you know, these potential regulations that are going after citizens that are not prohibited from law from making their own firearms. Currently, it's perfectly legal. The media and the 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 anti Second Amendment civil right bureaucrats and legislators like to call these ghost guns, right? right? Come up with the scariest name. Exactly, ghost guns. Like, hey, listen, Casper was a good ghost. (laughs) He should have the choice as to whether or she. I don't know what Casper was, but the choice as to whether or not he or she owns firearms, right? So we have a a great class of of citizens that are very technologically evolved. They're they're Hmm. handy and and with today's technology. They are literally making their own firearms, which has been legal to do forever, provided you're not federally prohibited. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. make a gun, buy a gun. If you're not federally prohibited, I don't see what the problem is. Listen, ultimately, we know that all of these laws, what do they say? There's 20,000, 25,000 gun laws on all the books between state and federal regulations Mm -hmm. and statutes. The people that, that are criminals, by definition, ignore law. Right. Right. So passing more laws, and I know it's a, a tired argument, but it's the fact. It's absolutely the fact. Good people do good. That's our nature. And bad people do the opposite. That's their nature. Mm-hmm. It's been that way since Cain and Abel. Yeah. So you say, you know, we want good people to have guns and bad people not to. Do you think we we do do enough? Like, just to play a devil's advocate, do we do enough to keep the so-called bad people from the people who shouldn't have guns from being able to get them? Or do you think there's more we could or should do? We should be better about following up on background checks or something. I I appreciate that question. So you have people that are going through background checks. Uh, Again, my my little segment of the universe is Massachusetts, intimately familiar with everything gun related here in this state. So we've had a number of reports, alleged reports of people that have been arrested and they went to court and their case was found to be not guilty or continued without a finding Mm -hmm. when these old paper records are being transposed to to you know up-to-date computer files uh the department of probation has transposed erroneously the criminal finding Uh. so these people that should be lawfully able to own guns because they went through the judicial process and the case was dismissed or continued without a finding are getting a guilty finding when nix or the state of massachusetts for the issuance of the licensing goes and reviews their criminal history right so so we have that so i'm very skeptical also i said it earlier listen there are some great people in law enforcement. God bless these people. I think many of them are just unselfish and they're mm-hmm. they're literally the heroes in my book, right? They're doing their job, but yet these court systems, we have a lot of legislators in Massachusetts. Yeah. They don't want to put criminals in jail. I mean, look at the prosecutor out in Suffolk County, right? We're no longer going to, to penalize shoplifters. What did we see in San Francisco last week? Guy walks into a Walgreens or rides in on his bicycle with a trash bag and starts throwing stuff off the shelf into the trash bag and pedals out. Right. Right. We're rewarding bad behavior. Maybe we're not rewarding it, but we're not punishing it. Mm -hmm. So we're losing our civility. And and that's that's really unfortunate. Where do you and I go? The civil folks. Where do we go? Right. Tom's on the radio in Connecticut right now. They're having a huge problem with a rash of carjackings. The carjackings are hugely up and they're tracing it back to, you know, they they said they weren't going to like prosecute teenagers for crimes under like a certain level. And so it's all these teenagers are, are 
carjacking cars from like nice suburbs. They're just going through until they find an unlocked car and starting it, like wandering down the street until they find one and then joyriding it. Some of them have died. It's, I mean, like what, how do you, you can't, um, like keep up with what people will do and when when you refuse to like prosecute things in a serious way it just creates an incentive for bad behavior because the perceptions out there that we don't care about enforcing what? the laws 100 percent, and i know that you have some beautiful young children at mm -hmm. the house and and i have a, a young son who is my world and i just i really feel for them i really feel for them if not enough of us get up it and start to make change Right. I, I just I'm not optimistic. A few years ago, I was optimistic. Right. I was optimistic by the policies imposed by our former president. Mm -hmm. I'm not optimistic with the policies being imposed by our current president. But we need to do something. We need to, to wake up. We need to be an, an educated electorate. Right. And I'm not seeing that. Yeah. So Some people I, mean I hold in very high regard that don't share my political views, right. they're coming at things with, with simply emotion. And, and they have, uh, for instance, Alice, mm -hmm. a, a, a friend of mine who I hold in very high regard, has been a big influence in my son. And uh, he says, you know, the NRA, they, they take in more money than any of the other unions. I'm like, where are you getting your information? Right? Right. Oh, they give more money to politicians. We're not, that's absolutely, we're like 28th. 30th on the list compared to all of the other right. unions, the NRA gets its strength by by members, not by dollars. Hey, let's face it, most gun mm -hmm. owners are cheap. <laughs> they really are. They'll, they'll drop they need to save their on money a nice for gun, ammo but, right but now. They won't throw $25. <laughs> exactly. They won't throw $25 to, you know, somebody that's, that's running for a seat in, in mm -hmm. Congress or, or the state legislature, right? We get our power by membership and, and the ignorance of people like that. I just say, you know, you just don't know a lot about the NRA. They think it's nothing but stale, pale male individuals. Right. I've been down. I've done work with the NRA on the state tra training council liaison. It is like the United Nations. When you walk into uh, Waples Mill wow. Road in Fairfax, Virginia, you people of every creed and nationality and, and, and gender, mm -hmm. and they're walking around armed and they're all doing yeoman's work helping to secure our choice as Americans as to whether or not we own guns for lots of different reasons. Yeah. So are you seeing more of that now, more of a diversity of gun owners? I, like I said, I had been reading some statistics that a lot of the newer gun owners right now during the pandemic, that it's like an, a more diverse group of people than ever before, maybe. 100% people of color, we're seeing more and more women. Uh, Gold does an awful lot of work with the well-armed woman chapter here in Massachusetts mm. and Massachusetts women gun owners uh, and, and just phenomenal people getting into it. And I'm learning more and more about these individuals and they're coming from different political backgrounds than I. I'm a, I'm a conservative libertarian, which makes right. it easy, right? Which makes it easy, but it, it's it's done well for me. And, and, and they're learning the hard way about what a bureaucrat or a legislature that's hell bent on taking away our Second Amendment civil rights can make. For instance, trying to, to buy a, a handgun in Massachusetts. For a dealer to sell a handgun in Massachusetts, it has to have undergone underwriter laboratories, uh, UL laboratories testing. It has to be an application made and reviewed by the Gun Control Advisory Committee. We actually have a Gun Control Advisory wow. Committee that was created by the legislature. Yeah, Republican Governor Paul Salucci in 1998 hmm. Uh, created that that uh, that committee and then we also have the attorney general's consumer protection regulations so ultimately what that means is if you go to a new hampshire gun shop you have 300 handguns in which you get to choose from in massachusetts we have 25 wow Right. So that's wild. But, but they say, oh, nobody's trying to take your gun. It's yeah. remember, we, we had this discussion about supply and demand. Right. They're just limiting our choices. Right. And sooner or later, our choice is going to be zero. Right. We're just we're not taking away your right to buy a gun. We're just getting rid of all the guns that you can buy. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> no cause or alarm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you mentioned our exactly. Republican governors, too. But, you know, in some ways, I think that you know, they're reacting to what they see on the ground and living around a lot of liberal people. Like you said, like, you know, you talk to people that you have a lot of respect for in your daily life, and then you hear their opinions on this. And it's just it's they just don't know. They're just reacting to like the headlines they see in the news or, you know, Democratic politicians sure. saying. And so, I mean, like, to me, that's like really where the problem lies, because politicians are they'll 
do what's popular. Like they don't really, at the end of the day, most of them have a really, you are correct. really strong backbone. You so, you know, I think like people who feel the way you and I do, we have to talk to more people about it or something and, and, and try and like combat it there. I, what do you, what do you do when you come across that? When you talk to people that you know are intelligent and you respect them and, and they just like, they don't know or aren't interested. And how do you kind of get through to people? I mean, do you just take them out to the range and show them around or what do you do? That, for me, that is the easiest way. Mm -hmm. If I can get somebody to the range and let them fire a small caliber pistol or a small caliber rifle at a piece of steel, you know, 50 or 100 yards away, that's just fun. And ultimately, they realize that, A, the gun doesn't go off by themselves, and B, nobody got hurt by the act of firing this gun. That mm -hmm. opens up the door. Listen, gun ownership isn't for everybody. And, and that's what makes you and I such great advocates because we don't we don't require, we don't say you have to own a gun. No, you just have to have, you just have to give me the choice, right? right if I want to own a gun or not. So so getting somebody to the range to actually realize, because think of the media. AR-15s put a hole in people that are this big, right? When we know that the AR-15 cartridge is only this big, right? Where is it? Right. Just a, a tiny little, the, the, the size of a Tic Tac, right? So we can educate them. We can provide factual information. If they want to accept it or not, That that's a different story, right? We need mm -hmm. to ap appreciate things based on fact and science or fact because science isn't always fact, right? Rather than emotion. It goes mm -hmm. back to, we have some legislators that are very intelligent. They know their subject matter, but it's all about power. They want to have all the power. Then we have another hand handful of legislators uh, that that base everything on emotion and as you say you know they're they want to they're going to choose whatever the popular statement or act is for that day mm -hmm. be damned our constitution and our second amendment civil rights all of the data favors the responsible gun owner i don't care what the subject yeah. matter is all of the data favors that responsible gun owner so then it boils down to a question of integrity you know you're you hold this oath of office are you going to uphold the united states constitution or are you not are you going to work against it and unfortunately we see too many republicans and democrats in massachusetts anyways not all of them we have some very pro second amendment civil rights democrats and very pro second mm -hmm. amendment uh, civil rights uh, republicans in in the state of massachusetts we may not agree on everything but but who does and that's mm -hmm. that's the ultimate goal trying to get through to the people that refuse to uphold the constitution and i get it they need to be educated but why are they turning down that education from mm -hmm. from groups and folks that have nothing but integrity for the subject matter right yeah well it's thanks to work like what you're doing that really i think makes a difference you know gets through to people you know educating people showing them you know, because I think a lot of people in our society today are just very disconnected from guns and gun ownership in general. They don't know anybody who would ever have a gun, so they don't think about it. So, you know, I think the work you're doing at Goal, that's the Gun Owners Action League, is so important. Educating people, letting people know about the laws, holding politicians accountable. Um, again, this is John Green, who was kind enough to join me this week and um and you can find him the, at goal.org if you want to know more about his organization and the work they do they have a podcast as well now that he's i've heard i've seen you've been on that that podcast i've as been well. on a few times yeah, yeah, yeah. So, garrett holcomb and, and jeff strider some of our board members run that so right. we'd love to have you on alice oh thank you i'd love to come on that's fantastic well i appreciate it so much and uh thank you everybody for listening and we'll catch you next time Clouds rolled in and I said Must have brought the rain from Boston But you looked at me and I felt the sun